when you're reading the book, they might kind of float over your head at times. But I do think like the Irish independence question is pretty core to the novel, especially in relation to so much of this book is about Stephen Dedalus forming his own identity and separating from the institutions that are really important. And you can imagine that the Irish independence struggle very closely mirrors something that Stephen Dedalus is going through himself as he's oh, imagining himself yeah. breaking away from his family unit, breaking away from his church unit, breaking away from a lot of the societal constraints to find that sense of independence. And there's little hints. Like I remember from my first reading, like in the very beginning, he's a young, young child and he's acting out uh, like a battle with prose where it's like Lancaster, York or something. And he imagines a green rose and like that's, the first time you read that, and if I hadn't seen a footnote the first time I saw it, I just remember this now, it would have went right over my head. But that green rose symbolizes the potential for Irish independence, you know? So those details are just so carefully layered throughout the book and are probably missed by most readers, myself included. Yeah. No, and that's a cool point, point because this is definitely like a classic buildings roman, like a com coming of age story for Stephen Dedalus. But yeah. you're right. It's also a coming of age for Ireland, right? Like this, this country is becoming <laughs> its own independent. And of course they, they have a lot of struggles thereafter, but you know, it's, it's, I mean, com it's actually pretty impressive. Like I can't really think of many other countries that did what Ireland did, you know, in the 20th century, I, I guess you could argue like Israel is a similar but not really, there's not many of those that like became free from their, their previous situation and then created like a successful, you know, Ireland is like, I looked, I saw this the other day. I think Ireland might have the highest per capita uh, GDP in uh, or something like that. They were like very high in the economic standing. I was like, damn, didn't expect that one. Uh, so I know just, you know, a hundred years later. They, yeah. Post Brexit, they attracted a lot more attention, obviously. Uh, I think, yeah, I mean, there's independent success stories. It just depends on your term of success, right? Like Ghana on the African continent is often treated as one of the success stories and there's others like it. But interestingly, like Stephen decides, and we're spoiling the end here, but this is not a plot driven book and we're talking about Irish independence. He decides to leave Ireland. Like he has that moment where there's a lot of conversation among his university classmates about whether to stick around and fight for an Ireland that can stand by its own versus continue to kowtow to the English. And instead of getting heavily invested in either side of the debate, his solution is to leave and forge his own path separate from all of that. So that you're like all of these political and themes that are like hanging over Joyce that he's thinking about, like they also hang over Stephen Dedalus. But a lot of his action in this book is to consciously refuse to let these things define him. He doesn't want these exterior events, be them religion or politics, to decide who he is. He wants to forge his own path. Right. And I think that's, I mean, at the core, we, we can even think about the title, you know, Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. And it's very clearly he's, um, this, this character from when he's young to as he grows up, it, it, this sort of sprout of the artist and in my head the artist is almost the the contrarian the you know the one who does follows his own path or her own path and in this story they would be going to you know he was like the mo maybe not the most or i think he had like a, an intellectual rival in school but he went to like uh i don't remember i don't know what, what know what you call it you call it a seminary when it's like a religious school for kids uh, he went to like a religious yeah. school for kids and he, I'm Jewish, sorry. Uh, he like is the star pupil or one of them. And everyone, he eventually is told at some point, I'm like, I think you have what it takes to be a priest if you want. And this is like a very important, difficult moment. And maybe like the pivotal moment in the book and that he struggles with is whether to follow through with this, to kind of follow the systematic path that he doesn't really he, he knows intellectual but doesn't actually like believe it or do his own thing with these poets that he admires i think byron lord byron was his favorite poet um so it's it's almost like you know the the artist to 
him and to maybe to Joyce. I don't know. What do you think is Joyce? What do you think Joyce is saying about the portrait of the artist? Like, why is that the title, and what does that have to do with um, you know his growth as a character, Daedalus? Yeah, well, I think the portrait is an important word, like every word being important to Joyce, they all matter. And when Joyce originally was writing his first novel, it was a much more stereotypical, very long autobiographical novel that kind of traced Joyce's life. And he abandoned that project and instead decided to write this, a much shorter book that really has these vignettes of the character finding himself and encountering these various situations. And he thought that would work much more effectively than something that tried to be incredibly comprehensive, right? So mm. in that sense, it's a portrait. Well, imagine like we're getting little glimpses of this character coming of age. And like you said, it is, it, it's not rigid in how it's structured. It flows in between time, between flashback, between moments that are given a ton of significance, no matter how mundane they might seem, and other periods of life that are kind of glossed over and that we miss. So in that sense, that's the portrait. The need for like what the artist means, I think that artist here in Joyce, maybe Joyce feels this way, always hard to make that argument. At least people used to argue Daedalus and Joyce were very connected, but the artist is a very isolated figure in society, right? Like for Stephen Daedalus to achieve what he wants to achieve as an artist in this book, he has to separate from all the voices that are telling him what to do, how to write, how to be, how to practice religion. He needs to be able to express his own ideas, even if that is an isolating exercise. And what truly separates the great artist from the people who are merely mimicking other artists is that ability to detach yourself and look at something through your own voice versus what he would call kind of the fraudster, imposter artists, right? That are there to simply recite and copy and build off of, or maybe not even add much to these existing traditions. Yeah. And you, you said to me uh, when we were just like chatting about this, that Joyce is a genius and you don't really throw that, that word is thrown around a lot, but it's not really, you know, you, you could say Ken Jennings is a genius, you know, it, it is Kanye different West than that for you. Kanye West. Well, like <laughs> bro, I won't even, we're not going to go there, but the, the, the genius thing, the, the analog that I, uh, that comes to mind for me is David Foster Wallace, right? And these are two tragically, I mean, I don't really know that much about James Joyce, but it seems like he, and again, we're, we don't know if he actually did connect with how isolated Stephen Dedalus was. But from the little whisperings that I do know about James Joyce, it seems like these genius people that really do operate just on a whole, like they're just on a different level. It makes sense that they would feel isolated like that. And it's not even because they're, it's almost like they are seeing the world. They, they see that one of the things that we talk about comedy that I respect about comedians is what they do. Comedians walk around looking for the absurdities of the world that are just accepted by us. And then they point them out. And I think that's what these geniuses, that's why a lot of comedians are pretty smart. These geniuses yeah. just see things in the world that, you know, like taking the freaking elevator up to the gym. Like that's obviously not that crazy, but there are so many little absurdities that we just gloss over and these people like James Joyce and like David Foster Wallace see, and probably some of those artists like Vincent Van Gogh and the people who really were like crazy, they are just in a different, they see it differently. And to me, that's why I have some empathy for those people. People are like, oh, they're just too eccentric. I'm like, bro, they're just in a, like, it's probably hard for them to be that way. Like, and that's, I'm, I'm alluding to Kanye a little bit, which I know he's <laughs> terrible. But, like, I feel bad for him. No, no, no. Him. He watched 21 Jump Street. It's all good. Everything's good now. And... <laughs> hey, he's back to normal. <laughs> yeah, he's good.